This is an interview with John Bivicki. It's September 1st, 2006. I'm Forrest Larson in the Lewis Music Library. It's my honor and privilege to have John Bivicki back for an interview. Um, it's September 1st, 2006. Um, John is Professor of Music Emeritus at the Berklee College of Music. We're also joined by um, Thomas Maga, who is currently Professor of Music at Berkeley as well. Thank you both very much for, for coming. Um, John, I want to ask you about um, musical influences. Um, these questions sometimes um, can, can, be, can be hard, and um, I've heard interviews with composers and asked about influences and things get kind of kind of surreal so um, I'm gonna try not to ask kind of kind of stupid questions about that um, there's certain composers that seem to have been important to you um, J.S. Bach, Robert Schumann particularly the choral music, Bela Bartok, um, Renaissance choral music um, your teacher Walter Piston and Richard Strauss I'm sure there's there's others um, Maybe we can go through some of these these composers here and talk about how they've been important to you um, as a composer. Um, but I'm also interested in music that um, that has really moved you, but may not um, influenced you as a, as a composer, because that sometimes happens too. But um, J.S. Bach seems to uh, figure strongly for you. Uh, also in your um, career as a choral conductor, you did um, Bach cantatas, which I had the honor of playing in orchestra a couple times under you. And your teacher, Walter Piston, um, strongly um, instilled a, tried to instill a, a love of J.S. Bach in his students. You want to talk about Bach a little bit? Well, Bach, of course, uh, I mean, none of us could write with, <laughs> without him in the background. and. I, my interest in counterpoint, of course, is uh, based on the con conducting I did of his works and the study I did of his works. And counterpoint is is the the muscle of of uh, contemporary music or, or all music, and uh, everything I've I, I've done uh, has, has started with Bach and the way of counterpoint, and and harmony too in a way, but. Um, I think the active, the activity of the of the contrapuntal uh, question and answer is what makes music viable in in mo in many ways. And uh, Bach. All I can say is that I conducted uh, one or two cantatas for thirty years each year, and uh, I never got tired of them. And uh, I did repeat some, but mostly I did a new a new one all the time, and it was great fun. It's been interesting as I've studied <coughs> some of your scores, and obviously I've only seen a small portion of, of what you've written. Um, and there's certainly a strong contrapuntal element to, to most of your music. Um, I was wondering, though, I haven't seen anything that was kind of strictly fugal in an extended way. Um, are there any pieces that uh, either have fugues or some extended fugal passages? Yeah, the the one that comes to mind is the uh, last movement of my second cello sonata, which is a big fugue. Uh -huh. And uh, as a matter of fact, Piston once told me about that piece. That if I'd left that movement off, it would have been a great piece. <laughs> uh, but I, I had fun writing that. I, I very seldom write... Um, a few all the way through. I mean, mm -hmm. I have uh, many fugal uh, expositions, if you will, yeah. and a lot of fugato, of course. But uh, mostly, it's the imitation, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's strict all the time either. Yeah, right. Uh, it's uh, and very often I will use uh, what uh, I refer to as a, r a rhythmic canon or a rhythmic. Uh, Mm -hmm. Fugal subject or imitation, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily have the same intervals, but has the same rhythm. Right, right. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say about uh, about J.S. Bach I influence and? Well, <laughs> well what can one say about a god? Yeah. I don't know what else to <laughs> yeah, say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
there's so many composers who feel that Bach is a real touchstone in, in oh, of course work, yes so. I mean, between Bach and Beethoven, you have really all the, the source of everything, anyhow. And uh, one of the reasons I got so interested in Schumann is because was of his interest in, in Bach. And in, in his choral music, he certainly was very influenced uh, by the Bach counterpoint. It was very interesting to me. So tell me more about the, the, the Schumann um, interest of yours. And um Well, I felt... Uh, very early on that he was a highly neglected composer, mostly because I wasn't so fond of uh, the, the Chopin type uh, that I would refer to as glitz <laughs> and, and, and the list uh, bravura. I didn't really feel that they compared at all to, uh, to what Schumann had done. And so I set about uh, in, in without really realizing it, a, a lifelong quest to show people that that Schumann's music was really important. And uh, a lot of people would try to tell me that Mendelssohn influenced Schumann. As personally, I think it's the other way around. I always have felt that way. And I find Mendelssohn, uh, you know, very good, but I certainly have I've never performed the big Mendelssohn pieces. I, well, I did Elijah once, but uh, I find them very boring compared to the big Schumann pieces, or the big Bach pieces for that matter. Or the little ones, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I just felt that Schumann had such depth, and he was always experimenting. And uh, his choral music was completely unknown. Uh, it's less so now with the uh, uh, the CDs, uh, <laughs> almost said whole piece. It shows yeah. my <laughs> antediluvianism. <laughs> um, it, you know, I went so far as to copy the parts out for the the C minor mass. And the parts for Advent lead, I copied them out by hand because they were uh, they were not available anywhere. Wow! And uh, I performed those pieces long before anybody else had. And to my knowledge, the first, the only performances of Advent the uh, Advent lead that I've ever heard are the ones I did. <laughs> There's no recording. I've, I've seen no uh, record of performances. Although I know it was done, I assume it was done in Boston in the 19th century. But I have no idea if it was. It's a great piece. Yeah, I, I, I don't know any of those. So. Yeah, well, I did it several times, and I wrote out all the all the parts. So it took me two performances to find out that the mistake that the trumpets kept making was mine and not theirs. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say <laughs> early, early. <laughs> Some of um, Schumann's. Um, Kind of free use of form and innovative forms. Did that, that also influence you as, as a composer? Very much so, yes. I mean, the, the last movement of the Second Symphony, uh, I mean, I've seen it referred to as formless, but if you if you really take a look at it, it's not formless at all. It's, it's taking a motive and developing it into a full-blown uh, utterance, if you will. And I tried to take that into a, a made-up a form which I thought would uh, somehow uh, ape that s same uh, succession of events in which uh, I, uh, first time I used it I think was in my first violin sonata. I have uh, five at that time one measure motives uh, rhythmic and melodic and uh, after the f five was, was stated then the first one was repeated expanded then the second expanded and and so on, so that the the whole first part of the ternary form uh, was a succession of expansions of each one of those ideas, and uh, in the recapitulation, so to speak, on the on the return of the uh, uh, opening section, I combined the uh, two two of the m motives to make it, and uh, it combined with both rhythmic and melodic elements. It, it's I think it's a successful movement. Yeah. Well, that technique, I guess you used in that trio with harp. Was it violin, cello, yes, and harp? Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you? Has that? Did that continue to be an important kind of uh, technique for you? Yes, I, I use it. Uh, I used it the last movement of the piano sonata that June has played so much lately. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I use it a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very. I mean, it. it basically, it's a contrapuntal. Uh, idea, although some some of the, the uh, 
obviously one of the elements can have a harmonic basis, but the the thing that's recognizable are, are the rhythmic motives, and uh, and sometimes a, an interval from a particular chord or something. We can get into this um, later, but um, since we're we're on it. Um, when you're working with um, developmental principles like that, and that's kind of the force behind a piece, um, does the, does that kind of dictate what the, the final form of the piece is? Are you looking at a, a larger architecture um, with with it to put that developmental stuff in? Yeah, well, uh, I, I'd have to say it's a sort of a combination. I never write a piece without having a, a very strong idea of what the, the form of it is because I'm convinced that that's the most important aspect of music and actually that's why I went into conducting to try and get some feeling for the the form of the pieces and the, and the, the time scale relative to different parts of a composition. Um, no, it's... Where was I? So we're talking about form and development and... Um, and yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. The the form comes f first for me, and then the, this uh, developmental idea of the of the in increasingly large uh, increments of the uh, of the uh, the elements would fit into a form. I mean, the, the form and, and that, the <coughs> movements that I spoke about were in the violence. Now there was a simple ternary form, mm -hmm. and I had the A and the A prime uh, using this technique, mm -hmm. and then B something else. And I'm trying to remember in the piano sonata was it came out more like a set of variations than uh, than a ternary form. Mm -hmm. But I always try to fit anything that I do into into a formal structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your forms are not always evident on the surface. I mean, that's a real creative way of, of doing yes, that. Yes, uh, of course, uh, I've been accused by a lot of people of not having any form whatsoever, but. Yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 it, I, my own notes uh, are always related to a specific form, and uh, every piece I've written I've always kept as I do it. And this, of course, it changes as I go along, but I keep my own my own uh, count, if you will. And uh, you know, from measure so and so to measure so and so was the development of uh, the first phrase of the f second theme, or something like that. I, it's very little arbitrary. Th arbitrariness in my music. Mm -hmm. It may sound it, but it's... <laughs> Have you done any stuff that has what you might call a rhapsodic form? Where it's kind of, kind, of, kind of an organic, you have a particular idea and then it just kind of expands kind of from the material itself? Um, well, of course, that's, that's what I was talking about with but the elements. Yeah, but, but, but as far as you didn't know, kind of know where the piece was going to go, but it, it's just kind of... Do you ever, have you ever worked that way? where? Where the the development of the material dictated the, the final form. Oh uh, well, th my friend uh, Hieronymus Skaczynskis, uh, that's the way he wrote. He that what it, what was happening at this moment uh, yeah. engendered what happened later. Right. And I had I must admit that I have very little of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm much more intellectual about it, which accounts for its lack of passion. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's no lack of passion in your music. <laughs> That's one of those stereotypes about um, about form and um, um, uh, Be Beethoven couldn't possibly have been a very good composer because he was so damn intellectual about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to pick up on um, Bell Apart talk later, um, but also um, I was. Reading that um, the Renaissance choral music was was really important to you. Yes, uh, because uh, well, I, I did so much of it with my with my choruses, and uh, I found you know, uh, well, danceable orchestral. I, I performed pieces of, of almost everyone, and uh, it's just fascinating. And of course, I I had that course at Harvard with uh, Gombeshi and rebarring the. Uh, the right. Renaissance music, and that, that that had a tremendous effect on me, and loosened up with my concepts of what a phrase was and what measures were, and it was a it was a great deal of fun. And uh, the Renaissance choral music, of course, even when it was barred, uh, you could you could see that the phrases 
didn't necessarily have too much to do with the way that particular editor barred it. Right. And uh, I mean, the Dunstable pieces are wonderful, and the, you know the uh, La Guerra. Who uh, who wrote that? Uh, that French. Uh, uh. Dufay. Hmm? Uh, Dufay. Dufay, maybe no er yeah. earlier. Uh, La Guerra, uh, mm. where he imitates the the cannon and everything. Uh, I'll, I'll think of it. <laughs> it's not. It's not my show. No, no my show the mass. Uh, uh, I, I have to look up my yeah. old programs. Yeah. <laughs> I did it twice. It was. Uh, Could I ask a sure. question, John? Uh, did you write an essay or an article about Schumann's either his choral music or some aspect? It's. I thought when I first met you at Berkeley, there was something you showed me. Yes, uh, am I, I, I'm sure yeah. I, I have done. It might have been a transcript of, I had a radio program at, at Harvard ah. in which I spoke a great deal about that. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure I did. And I used to write everything about every piece that uh, we did uh, yeah. w with a, what a, whatever course I had at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember you showed me a, yeah, an art, yeah. some kind of article, so I bet it was a coming uh, out of that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I, interesting to see again. <laughs> so also the, the music of Richard Strauss seems to figure um, prominently. Oh yes, well I, and that, see I'm, I'm not sure he's influenced me as a composer but I just admire, I, I think he's the certainly the greatest composer of the 19th century including everyone and uh, I, f I feel that no one has ever had a larger technique in everything he did than he has. And uh, I, I don't think that he's influenced me as much as uh, Beethoven or Bach or Schumann or Bartok, but mm -hmm. but I certainly am very aware of his music. And I think the the operas, the uh, Frauen Schatten or Egyptian Helen, the, the greatest music possible. Are there other composers like Richard Strauss that you really admire but haven't influenced that have not influenced you as a composer? Oh yes, um, I mean I ad I admire a great deal of Brahms, <laughs> mm -hmm. Dvorak. Um, I'm trying to think of composers that I haven't uh, stolen from. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very very fond of Shostakovich, and I think he's a great composer. But I'm not sure that I've been influenced by him at all. Yeah. Uh, Stravinsky. Uh, I mean, uh, some wonderful pieces, but I don't yeah. ascribe to the techniques. Right. It's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. So um, my next set of questions relates to stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, um, let me ask you this. I mean, we were talking a little bit about form. Um, is there anything more you want to talk about? Just your your <coughs> concept of form and what it is, um, and how it figures in, um, in 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 composition for you. Well, um, as you know, I teach a course in the Beethoven String Quartets at Berkeley and a course in the Bartok Chamber Music. And the reason I got into the Bartok Chamber Music was because I recognized that he was using classical forms, and of course. Looking at the Beethoven quartets for even casually, you find out that he didn't tremendous expansion of what Haydn had left him, and uh, it seemed apparent to me that if I wanted to be a, a good composer, which is all one can hope for, is that I would have to get so that I had control of form. And uh, sonata form is the biggest form of the, of the classical period, and includes all the others, in, in, in fact. Uh, and it was, for me, it was fascinating to follow through and figure out how Bartok used it, and then thereby myself using the forms. And I used sonata form for most of my big movements, uh, adapted, of mm -hmm. course. But Do you use some of the, the harmonic um, um, implications in sonata form, or are you seeing it more as an as an architecture? Because some people see it very much as a as a, <coughs> as a harmonic um, 
no, uh, it, kind of progression. No, it, it mostly is architectural. Yes, mm -hmm. um, because the harmony. Um, well, the harmony f for me changes with every piece. I mean, I, I don't have the same set of chords that I use. Uh, I mean, I know that one four five one has not been exhausted yet, but uh, <laughs> I, it, um, for me, I haven't got the imagination enough to do to use those <laughs> anymore. But uh, no, I, it's mostly architectural for me, not not harmonic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You hear some composers talk about. They use this phrase of control of the musical materials, um, and it can mean lots of different things to different composers. Um, but is is that something? Is that a concept that you think of, and um, does it have any meaning to you? And um, Con control of musical? The yeah, they'll they'll talk about that that they <coughs> want control of their their musical materials as though uh, some composers don't. I mean, there are some serial composers who take it in a particular direction. But um, I mean, and maybe that's where the the, the, the concept came. But um, is that is that something that you kind of think about? Um, is that is that a concept that you think about or, or not? I don't want to pursue it. If uh, no, no, I, I I think it's a given. I mean, I I think that uh, willy nilly that happens uh, if you're writing music, you have to have control of your material. Mm -hmm. um, I don't set out to do it, but I I certainly. I mean, every time you write counterpoint, you have to have control. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm I'm not sure I know how to answer that yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, one of the paradoxes that I find in um, some of uh, serial um, composition is they 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 talk about control, but they end up having some um, because they're strictly bound by these rules. They don't actually have certain choices, and so th there's a certain lack lack of control that comes up. Um, well, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I mean, I cover the, t the t ser serial writing all the time, and, and uh, when I used to teach the techniques of, of uh, composition, I covered it all the time. I don't ascribe to it. I think I think it's narrowing. On the other hand, some of the techniques that they developed are very, very um, open up all kinds of possibilities. But if you're stuck with a, a role, <coughs> then you have we have a constriction that I don't think is necessary to have. Right. Um, later on, I have a bunch of questions about serialism that we can we can pick up from there. Um, a predominant element in your music is dissonant harmony. Can you talk about kind of how that um, came to be a you know a central part of your your musical language? And well, the opening of the. Uh, Last moment of the Beethoven Ninth probably had as much to do with it as anything. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, I, I said to myself, "Jesus, uh, that's pretty, inter pretty interesting." <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm sure that's one of the earliest things. But uh, you know, and then, it, with all due respect, listening to a lot of the Schumann things, where he will take a, 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 an upper neighbor and resolve it about four chords later. In the meantime, it seems as if he didn't know what he was doing, but it, it's not true. And uh, for instance, in the in the Schumann Violin Concerto, uh, he has a passing tone between a, th in, you know, a, a third. He has a passing tone, but what he does is to have the third going at the same time as the passing tone, so that you end up with the, you know, let's say C, D, and E at the same time. Of course, they thought that was showing his approaching insanity. Mm -hmm. But uh, all he was doing was saying, well, there's no reason why you can't have the passing tone present at the same time as the, the two targets. Yeah. And that sort of thing is what interested mm. me from the very beginning. And uh, and then when I got into the Bartok uh, quartets and, and analyzing them, finding that the counterpoint is, is, is arranged so as to be consonant as passing tones and dissonant on strong points. Yeah. It's just the opposite. So what I, when I taught my technical my technique classes, I would always have them write dissonant counterpoint with the uh, sixth and thirds being passing tones only and things like that, right. or upper neighbors or something. <coughs> but the seconds and sevenths and tritones being the the uh, target points. Right. <laughs> you you must be familiar with the um, the Charles Seeger um, book on dissonant counterpoint. 
of oh. no one. Oh, interesting. Or how about Henry Cowell's um, book on um, um, 20th century techniques? He has a whole section on. I I, I haven't seen the Cowell book, but well, I, I know Banshee though. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, he's got in his book. It's, it's called I think it's called New Musical Resources. He's got a whole chapter on dissonant counterpoint. Too. Yeah, well, I, I they specify these these rules that the strong points must come on a so-called dissonant. Um, I, I I must be I must have been to being lax on on yeah. the, that kind of research. Yeah. That's Mostly it's the music that yeah, I've looked at, right. but uh, yeah. I, I haven't read either of those books. Uh -huh. so well, I, I, I want to go look at them now, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, the the little that I've looked at your, your or the the few scores that I've seen, and that you've written a lot more than than what I've seen. Um, I would describe your harmonic language as dissonant, but not atonal, um, in the sense that you're not avoiding certain um, tonal cadences um, and stuff like that is would would you is that accurate in the way I'm looking yeah, at I, that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it is. But I mean, <coughs> for me, uh, I always have a tonal center in my music, mm -hmm. and I know that for many people they would say, "Well, you're crazy." But I always have a tonal center, and uh, half the time, what is, what I've been doing is to try and achieve. Different methods of a ch of a, of proving that this is the tonal center. Uh, for instance, this one thing I found that if if you will do a fast moving counterpoint with eleven of the twelve tones, and then zero in on the twelfth one, and hold it, you've had a good cadence, mm -hmm. and that really works. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I've used it many times, including the piece <coughs> I just finished, and. Um, it seems formless, but it's not because it really it really functions well. The ear, you haven't heard this this one sound, you haven't heard it, and then when you land on it, it's it's cadential. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I I do often in my music is to the, take the things from standard, what Piston called common practice harmony, that that will work for everything like contrary motion. I mean I when I taught the techniques classes I would show them the you know major triads and contrary motion and it's a perfectly wonderful cadence I'm like a, a G flat triad a B flat triad an E flat triad D flat triad a C triad in contrary motion breaks every rule in the book but it's a wonderful cadence and uh, I mean I know Hindemith used it and uh, you can apply that what I did then was uh, back in the days when I could play the piano at all I would then show them that it didn't really matter what I did in either hand. If I st still kept the triads up here, or the, uh, I had done the open fifths down here, I, I could do anything. And then f finally I said, you know, if you really want to adapt it, so you can go plock, 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 <laughs> and it sounds like a cadence because it's in contrary motion. <laughs> well, either way, but uh, I mean, I secretly don't feel that just any old sound will do, but. Uh, if you have contrary <coughs> motion, you can have inc incredible dissonances, and the biggest problem is to decide what the final resonance is, whether it's a choral chord, whether it's an open fifth, as Hindemith very often disappointingly does, or, <laughs> or whether it's a dissonant sound, or mm -hmm. what. Yeah. But you can, you can achieve a cad cadential feeling by contrary motion very, very well, and it what that does is to eliminate the need for the, the root motion that uh, immediately says, uh, you know, four, five, one. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, a real striking feature of some of your pieces is you'll have some real wildly dissonant stuff, and then it the end of the piece or the movement ends on a consonant chord. Yes. Um, and John yep. Corley mentioned that to me. And it, it made him smile, and of course, <laughs> it has made me smile. And um, <laughs> Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, all I, do, all I was doing was imitating Hindemith, that's all. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I felt that, the, you know, Hindemith is a very important composer to me uh, because he had such control of everything. But I never could understand why he would open, end with an open fifth when it seemed to have nothing to do with what came before. And so I was trying to, I was trying to find out that way in my, in my, in my own music. And mm -hmm. 
Uh, I hope it worked. I don't know. Mm -hmm. John seemed to like it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a, a little kind of twinkle in your eye with that too? Um, Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Uh. I mean, I'm, I know uh, the end of my sketch so moving in the, the second cello sonata. What the hell? I have C and D going, you know, plunk, 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 and and then I end on an A flat. <laughs> yeah, little things like that. <coughs> Another aspect of your music, um, again, this is my, I guess, my personal kind of in, um, interpretation of what my ears um, are hearing, um, and I mean this in, in, a, in a positive sense. There's a, the dissonant harmony creates a, what to my ears is a gritty surface texture. And for me, what that does is it takes my ears to a deeper level. Um, do you think about it that way? And um, and how do you think of the the, the kind of the texture? Well, uh, all, uh, dissonance is 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 harmonic motion. I mean, uh, e every style, no matter what it was, uh, every harmonic style, what gave forward motion was what happened with the dissonances. Right. And, uh, and, and so I just tried to adapt that to my own music that. And, and again, there's the Hindemithian principle that as you go towards the cadence, the amount of dissonance increases, and then the denouement is, is, is in his case, the open fifth, uh, or a triad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so I think this uh, dissonance creates harmonic motion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there something about dissonant intervals in and of themselves that attracts your ear, if you're just Playing a, you know, some 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 minor seconds at the piano, and you just no, kind of listen to the resonance that way. No, I'm equally fond of a major sixth. I really am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that's interesting. I mean, everybody comes to that differently. I mean, yeah, yeah. For, for me, I love to sit down at the piano and and listen to the resonance of, of so-called yeah. dissonant. Well, sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I. Uh, Bartok's use of the twelve tones that they're all equal. Yeah. And for me, uh, all the intervals are equal. <laughs> Sometimes that that final chord, that major chord, and your and your piece can can be unbelievably intense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, and yeah. You, you learn things. I mean, <coughs> for instance, you can end on anything if you'll if you just come back to it a couple of times and hold it longer than anything else. Then it's a cadence, mm. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. and I've I've tr I've tried that on in some pieces too. I've written so much music that I've tried everything I can think of actually. <laughs> so another aspect of your your um, music is the musical content can be um, quite dense, but the textures are, are very clear, um, and that seems to be a. A, an important um, aspect of you, and I know that the piston was um, real insistent on that. Do you, is that a legacy from from piston, or is that something that's also it's something that's also inherent in kind of how you write? But um, um, yeah, I think both. Are, I mean, obviously, piston stressed that, and uh, the, the criticisms he had of what I was writing always in, in, involved. A, a thickness of texture that uh, you know he says that's not going to work. And, uh, but uh, on the other hand, that's the way I feel about it. Anyhow, I mean, I mean, I love Shosti because he does things that you know it can be incredible, complex, but it's always clear. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember Kachiskas told me one time that the, the the thing about my music that stood out was that everything was, it was always clear what I was doing and. For him, it was because he knew what was going on. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's particularly evident in the, um, the the country band music because that ensemble is inherently dense. You know, winds yes. are not inherently transparent, um, and you found a way to work with um, you know a, a large a large wind ensemble like that, and th there's not mud. Um, no, I, and and the thing is that. But the concert band music, uh, John and I were such good friends for so many years, and I knew he was going to do a piece of mine whenever I, whenever I did it, and he was always after me to write another piece. 
And so I started with the concert band. I, w I wasn't uh, reorchestrating something that I'd done for something else. Right. And so uh, I had the luxury of thinking of the textures as they were, not as how they would adapt to something that was orchestral to begin with. And uh, I think it shows in, in my concert band music, if anybody takes the trouble right. to listen to it. Well, as, as John Carley put it to me, you found a concert band sound. Yes, I hope know, so. Not translating an orchestral thing and seeing the concert band as a second cousin to the, yeah. to the orchestra. I have only one piece that I did <coughs> with the idea that it would be a concert band or orchestra, and that's because of the commission that I got. That was Caroline's Dance? Carolyn, yeah. Caroline's Dance. That's yeah. the only piece I ever did that had anything to do the two had anything to do with each other. I mean, I, I feel very comfortable writing either, but I never thought of one as a reflection of the other. Mm -hmm. Have you ever used pre-existent themes as a basis for a piece? Uh, let me see. You mean like uh, Sur le Pont d'Avignon or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I mean e either you know as a as a basis for a theme and variations, or just um, you know a, a theme that just becomes an important part of the the, the, the piece. Uh, uh, well, twice I've used a theme of somebody else in a variation. Uh, mm -hmm. My f uh, friend for many years, Nicholas Van Slyke, wrote a cello sonata, and I took a tune of his of in in uh, in the, my piano sonata for her variation movement because mm -hmm. uh, he was going to uh, well he did the first performance of it and, and then uh, I have one piece uh, uh, that uh, Bevy wrote the tune <laughs> well yeah that's the yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. she took lessons you know from the, uh, the Nick Van Slyke uh, uh -huh. and she said I wrote a piece and it was you know, <laughs> going up and down a, a major major ninth on a major night court. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, uh, I adapted oh. it. <laughs> so you're referring to somebody named Bevy? Who, who's this? Uh, Excuse me? You, this person you're talking about, Bevy? That you yes, uh, she's my, uh, my live-in uh, companion. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Of and, uh, uh, 50 years. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, more, more than 50. Wow. <laughs> Have you... Um, um, and we'll get into Bartok in a minute, but a, a big aspect of Bartok's music is uh, his use of, of folk material or um, folk-inspired kinds of material um, and some of the um, you know, rhythmic gestures and stuff like that. Um, have you um, used any things like that, any kind of popular forms? or? Um? No, I, I, I never have used uh, any folk tunes or uh, anything like that. I've certainly used the rhythms that Bartok found in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's fascinating to see some of the, the uh, Greek f folk tunes and the, and the complex rhythm, Romanian, Bulgarian. And I certainly have used the uneven rhythms, which mm -hmm. I think is a large characteristic of a lot of my music, but never have I ever used folk tunes. Right. No. Or any other tunes. So. I'm very narrow-minded that way. <laughs> 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 Besides, what they call folk music in the United States isn't folk music anyway. It's all written, so it's, what do they call it folk music? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, something just popped into my mind, John, uh, getting back to the uh, trans uh, clarity of, of your textures. Uh, since Piston is a product of the French yeah. influence uh, uh, and naturally uh, absorb that that uh, French clarity in his textures and yet you've become such a, a fan of, of the German oh yes uh, so German music is my yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, it's it's kind of interesting that uh, it this uh, I'll call it a French influence even though it's not yeah you know <laughs> uh, it's part of your, your music in yeah, spite I, of in spite of the German strong German uh, yeah, I, um, influence, you know, the, the, I, I would <coughs> say that the German music has influenced me much more than the French. Yes, in, in general, yeah. yeah, but not not so much in the texture. Well, thing. perhaps not. I mean, I'm thinking of. I, I never thought of it that way, but you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I find it interesting in some of the German counterpoint, the individual lines can be very interesting, but they're all together, you, you, you can't really make them out. It's pretty pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. some of the Bach counterpoint, it's, yeah. it's so, <laughs> you know, the B minor mass and stuff, individual lines, just take the viola part, and you just like, that could be a piece all by itself, but <laughs> yeah. there's so much other stuff going on. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit more about um, the Bartok's music. Um, he, um, you had a long-standing interest in his music, and he's um, influenced you. Um, um, and you've um, you've used in your own music, and in, in, in the way that Bartok has um, is his interest in arch or pyramid forms. Um, yeah, the pyramid form. The I mean, of course. I know it all came from Beethoven, because <laughs> mm -hmm. Beethoven, and, and, uh, <coughs> you can find in the Eleventh Quartet, the last movement, you can find an arch form uh, very easily. And uh, Bartok, I mean, the arch form can come from two 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 ways basically. Uh, one is you re invert the order of the two themes in the recapitulation of a sonata form, and you have an arch form. Mm -hmm. Or you can take a rondo form and eliminate the repeats of the A until the final one, and then you have an arch form. And so, and that's what I teach my pupils that an arch form is a sort of a logical uh, adaptation of classical rondo or sonata, depending mm -hmm. on which one. And uh, I've always felt that way, and uh, so therefore I found the arch form very satisfying, and. Uh, the first incipient one is in the eleventh quartet of uh, Beethoven, and Bartok uses it a great deal, of course. And so does everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, ternary form in a way is an arch form, right? Yeah. So right. you just to take it one step further. Right. Right. Insert one more, and they've got. I mean, it, it's not that far away from. It's a classical form, really. If you, Mm -hmm. With just adding one little section, <laughs> A B C B A is pretty close to A B A. If um, somebody was looking at your scores and didn't know about your interest in in Bartok, um, one wouldn't necessarily say, "Oh, there's a a Bartok influence there." Um, I'm um, and there's a movement in your suite for band Opus 60 that's marked um, homage to, to Bartok. Yes. it's the most consonant movement of the of the piece. Yes, tell me uh, about that. I was really struck by that. Well, in in the in the throes of trying to keep my piano technique up enough to play the in the harmony class, what I had to play, of course, I kept looking at Microcosmos, mm -hmm. and as a piece. Uh, on which that slow movement is based. That, uh, uh, what the hell is it called? I don't know. Waves, something. Uh, something. Uh -huh. uh, it's got the, exactly that texture. Wow! And um, uh, I, uh, I just adapted it and mm -hmm. and I made a set of variations on it. And uh, that's why it's so constant because in the bar talk it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've forgotten what the hell the name of the. It's probably from the fourth volume. I, I want to say ocean or waves or something like I'm gonna that. I want to have to look that up. I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. Uh, you'll find that, you know, da da dee da. Yeah. Uh, you'll find that in the Bartok. It's, it's an absolute. Uh, well, I won't say it's a steal, but. It's, it's pretty close. Uh -huh. <laughs> the beginning of it. I mean, uh, it's a time-honored tradition with composers. That's why I said, yeah. Thing. That's why I say homage to Bartok, and the reason I said homage to <coughs> Piston is because that's Piston's tune. Uh huh. And I asked him if I could use it, and he said, "Oh, that little snippet, sure." And he wrote me a letter <laughs> saying that it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> your um, your dissonant harmony um, is is. To my ear, it's quite different from Bartok. Bartok's, I think of, is at times very acidic, but I never find your dissonant harmony with that kind of acidic. Yeah, I quality. think the thing with Bartok's harmony is it's almost impossible to pin down any system. Um, every piece is different. It's, mm. it's amazing. It's a uh, that's one of the things that's so interesting about him that if you're looking at the second quartet or the fifth quartet, you're not looking at the same kind of harmonic language at all. Yeah. Um, 
in, in when I'm using uh, obvious dissonant harmony, I'm making I have made up a cadence formula which I use for the particular piece, and uh, when I make up these cadence formulas or construct them, I I use the, the Hindemith principle of an increasing dissonance and resolution, so that the, these chords. I use them in the same order, although not necessarily all of them. I mean, let's say I have six scores, I'd go one, two, three, four, five, six to expose them, and then I might go two, three, four, five, six, or I might go five, six. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So that the, the theory in my head is that a listener who takes the time to listen would be able to get that series of chords as the basis for that movement. and. I think that people who know my music well enough to have heard it enough times can do that, and uh, I, I know it. I mean, Corley certainly did, and uh, I don't do that for every movement, but I do that a lot. And some of the most dissonant sounds that I have are when I use that technique. I know too that you've uh, opened up a lot of possibilities for your students. I've heard you yes, uh, when yeah. a student is stuck. Yes, I've heard you. Uh, I, I his, his desk is over around the corner from yes. my desk at the at the school yeah. at the college. He hears me doing and all the swearing. Ne <laughs> <laughs> never, never, never. 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 <laughs> but uh, I, I hear him uh, explaining this uh, this process to to students. Yes, and that's it seems to work many yeah, times. Yeah, it does. Huh? Yeah, uh, some some students take to it. Uh, it's, it saves their lives because mm. they get stuck. They don't know what to do anymore. And so when somebody is intelligent, like uh, Sylvia, for instance, she, oh. she took to that like it was uh, mother's milk. <laughs> is this she, a student of yours, Sylvia? Yes, yes, yeah, Sylvia uh, uh, San, Miguel San Miguel from years ago. And she wrote a piece for Corley uh, that he loves. <coughs> and, uh, Do you he, remember the title of that piece that she wrote for John? Gosh, you remember uh, I, I was there, but I... He did it two or three times. Yeah, uh, he loved that piece, and he, did a, he loved the Lance piece, which was... Mm. Uh, also influenced by that, but not so much as the Sylvia's. No, but what I what I did, what I do with the, my students when they're stuck is to give them something that they can. I say, well, you can write a piece with one four two five one, can't you? And they say, oh, sure, you know. <laughs> and then I say, well, how about uh, you know one two three four five? And then I, I show them this technique, and some of them really take to it, and they can write a whole piece by using that succession of chords. And uh, some some people have been very successful with it. Mm. I, I use it as one of the things that I do, and it's 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 a way to to uh, really depend on and have a link with the past. That's mm -hmm. what I try to tell them. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more about um, Walter Piston's influence on you. There's obviously <coughs> the, the clean textures, and I guess he was really big. On this notion of stylistic consistency, um, um, how does that? Um, how is that for you, as far as? Um, well, uh, I tell you one. One of the reasons, I, 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 of course, I'm getting into dangerous ground now. <laughs> one of the reasons I've never, I would say, have been influenced by or really. Have ad uh, admired Stravinsky as much as uh, Bartok and Hindemith, or, or Schoenberg for that matter, is because of his chameleon-like approach to music, and I couldn't stand it. Uh, I mean, there's not the growth of, in Schubert, for instance. There was a growth, and uh, if Schubert lived another ten years, he probably would have been the greatest composer that ever lived, because er he grew at, uh, all constant. Bartok, the same Beethoven, they grew as they as they as they went on writing. Uh, for me, uh, the approach that uh, Stravinsky had, which was that every, you know, Bézé de la Fée and the Rite of Spring written by the same composer, uh, I mean, it just boggles my mind. And so that's, my idea was always to be consistent. And so that's all I could say about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and even within a particular piece or a, a movement, there's, um, there's a kind of a consistency of materials that I'm I'm seeing there. Uh, yeah, well, of course, uh, you know that's that's composing, isn't it? To, to yeah. have a minimum amount of materials and do a great uh, as much as you can with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
want to ask you some about some of your non-musical influences on your music. You know, visual arts, poetry, literature, philosophy, science. Um, I know that you have a particular interest in um, Kandinsky. Um, yes, but, um, I, I've been very interested in painting ever since <laughs> ever since I grew up, and you know, I've, I'm, I'm when I have been in the Tate Gallery in London and see the late Turners, I'm in absolute awe. You know, if, uh, the power of things like that. It's like the Michelangelo uh, uh, sculptures that were still in the stone in the in Florence, uh, n near near the near David uh, statue, and I can't help but uh, I mean, painting has had a very powerful influence on my at least my artistic thinking. I don't know how it relates exactly to the, my music, but mm -hmm. uh, I've been very, uh, and I tried painting too. I did about uh, sixty or seventy things when I was younger, uh -huh. really? and I finally decided that I really should stick to writing music. <laughs> I also did. I wrote over a hundred poems. Wow! <laughs> Have you set any of those to music? Uh, no, I'm afraid that I didn't keep. Uh, most of them. I didn't keep any of the poems, actually. Yeah, maybe a couple of them. Uh -huh. If I look in my... And uh, I, I I kept a couple of pen and ink things that I did. But, you know, it, it's hopefully I was... Uh, what's the word I want? Uh, Self-analytical enough to know that they were crap. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> I stuck to the music. Uh -huh. and, and I, knew I, I knew I was onto something with the music. Uh -huh. <laughs> Is there... Um, any particular literature or poetry that um, has um, inspired you? Well, I'm, I'm very fond of, uh, I mean, I, I was very fond of Swinburne for a while because it was musical. And, uh, you know, the cataract at Lodora, and the, you know, and the, on, the automatopoetic uh, things of that even Poe did sometimes. Mm -hmm. They, You know, things like that fascinated me, but there was always a musical reference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I read uh, James Joyce, and uh, I read all of those. It was, you know, it's great fun. I still do a lot of reading, but I, I'm not reading technical journals as much as I used to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any philosophers or scientists' writings that have? Well, yes, I I was. Uh, I, f I felt the kinship to Spinoza's uh, idea of the monads, and then, you know, it, I was trying to find some reason for my irreligious uh, attitude towards the church th in which I grew up. And uh, in Spinoza, I found a way with the monads, and uh, each one is every individual a monad, and God is the monad of monads. And and I, tr I, tr I struggled through the critique of pure reason and. Uh, by the time that I was Kant, right? Yeah, yeah, Kant. right. And you know, I never got through it all. And but Sp Spinoza, and then I've Bertrand Russell. I find I found somebody that I could <laughs> understand. And the German philosophers, uh, the, the problem was, as far as I concerned, they spent so much time explaining every sentence that you, it was very hard to fi figure out what the hell they were saying. <laughs> I mean, that's really yeah, true. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, yeah, Hegel was particular. Hegel was yeah. the worst. Yes. Yeah. And I really, I went into it quite a lot when I was yeah. younger. I spent a long time with that. Yeah. And uh, and then Bertrand Russell was a was a, was a godsend to me. Right. There's <laughs> a short book that he wrote called Problems of Philosophy. Yes. That's a brilliant book. It's almost uh, poetic. It's wonderful. I, yeah. And uh, the Principia Mathematica that he did with Whitehead, uh, that I mean, I that was beyond me. But what he did with the the philosophical, uh, I was very important to me. Yeah as an individual. Yeah. Um, you were speaking about your, as you described, ir irreligious, re irreligiosity. Yes. <laughs> um, there's some sacred music that you've written. Um, how how does that kind of relate to, to, to Well, that? the sacred music that I've written uh, it equates to uh, in income. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 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 if you get a commission for a few hundred dollars and they say, well, y we want you to set some psalms, then you set some psalms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's that's what I've done. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the greatest music ever written has been written to masses. Yeah. I don't have to necessarily agree with the text. Right. 
but some of the greatest music ever written is used as religious texts right. for whatever reason. And I know perfectly well that, the, for instance, the late Haydn masses were not written with the church in mind at all. So it's okay for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, Ray Vaughan Williams was an atheist, and he wrote so much. He was a church organist yes. and wrote all that sacred course, music. Yeah. And, yeah. and as I, I'm fond of saying, I went to church every week. Yeah. To rehearse my chorus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Verdi would be another example of uh, an atheist writing a yeah. very powerful religious piece. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Same yes, piece. that's yeah. what's going to be more powerful than that piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> so this next topic um, is is huge, and we <coughs> obviously can't go through all aspects of it, uh, but I want to, um, it's the legacy of, of 12-tone and serial music. Um, it's had a huge impact in so many different ways on, on music and in academia and all that. Um, you came of age as a composer when it was a very powerful and dominating force in some circles. Do you remember at the time um, are there kind of rec recollections you have and discussions you have with fellow composers and students? Um, um, I mean, as distinct from how you might s see it now, but when you were really in the thick of that, how well, how do you well, recall I, I, that? I tell you, as far as I'm concerned, my attitude towards that has been consistent because I felt that way from the beginning. That any technique, which if you can count to 12 and write music, is too simplified for me. And that's the way I felt about it then, and that's the way I feel about it now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have an absolute modicum of musicality, and you can write a symphony if you will use the 12-tone system. doesn't make it good music, it doesn't make it bad music, but it doesn't necessarily make it music either. Mm -hmm. And I tell my kids, if you want to write a 12-tone piece, and I made them write a 12-tone piece because it's a technique, and you need a technique of some kind to write music, I, s I made them write their 12-tone pieces. Some of the things that they came out with are very important, and it f in, an, in, a, in a peculiar way it sort of freed up some kind of things. And uh, with this highly constrictive method, uh, freed up a lot of thinking. And, and, and It's a paradox, but it's a very good one. And I hope I've used what I consider the, the important aspects of what happened with the 12-tone. And I've written exactly one twelve-tone piece in my life, and that was just to do it for fun. What piece was that? Oh, it's Tobal II. <laughs> oh. What's the instrumentation? It's a symphony orchestra. Yeah. Wow. It's strictly twelve-tone, and uh, I haven't heard a performance of it. And as a matter of fact, I don't even have the parts because nobody's been interested in it. But wow. still. When was that written? Oh God. Or even a decade? Uh, do you remember what? Seven or eight years ago. Uh huh. Oh, it's Ten so years ago. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, I, I know one thing. It's going to sound like my music, even though it's twelve tone because it's twelve tone, but it's strict. It's absolutely strict. But I make it uh, work for what I yeah. what I want to do. Well, when um, Copeland used it, it's the same thing. It still sounds like the, the piano quintet's a yeah a twelve tone piece. Yeah. Or Roger Sessions, the same thing. That's yeah. right. The yeah. thing is that you can, I I tell. I d again, I tell my students, it doesn't matter what technique you do. If you're writing music because you, you have a need to or you r r want to, it's going to sound like you, even if you're using 12-tone or you're using 1-4-5-1. Uh, uh, one, one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's going to sound like your music. And that's what I try to tell them from the beginning to give themselves, you know, they, they need to have confidence in their own, in their own thinking. The 12-tone, for me, it's very constrictive. And uh, it's so easy to write that I don't consider it uh, someone who writes all 12 tone. It could be a great piece. I mean, the, the Berg Violin Concerto is a great piece. Wozzeck is a great piece. Uh, the Schoenberg, f f f you know, third and fourth quartets, they're fine pieces. I don't know if I think they're great pieces, but I think, for instance, Schoenberg, the middle period is by far the most interesting music. Mm -hmm. The, the pre-12 tone stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the t yeah. stuff between uh, Gorolita and, uh, yeah. and the baritone serenade, yeah. Right, right. I mean, Pierre Lunaire and Hervat uh, Tongan, the f pieces for orchestra and all. Yeah. Th that's the greatest stuff. 
Yeah, and then there's some sort, I think it was the Opus 11 um, piano pieces. The piano pieces, that's yes. what started it all, yes, yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, n not that I don't, I don't love Gurulita, I do. It's probably one of the greatest romantic pieces ever written. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, he really shows what a great composer he is with a, that atonal period. Right. Yeah. But it must have been very difficult to write that stuff. Mm, I so know. Well, if I do that, it's going to sound like, a, you know, 5, 7, or a, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> How did you see the effect of, of um, serialism, you know, kind of during its its heyday? Of what? The, 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 the effect of serialism oh. on other composers and just the, 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 the music scene in Boston. How did, how did you observe that? Well, I felt like they were doing uh, uh, what uh, Stravinsky did, is to go with whatever the current mode was. I. I was never tempted, and I felt betrayed by my friends who went and started writing 12-tone music because it was the, the thing to do. Mm. I mean, I really felt very strange about that. Did you have discussions with composers who kind of went that way and why they did it? Because oh, sure. some people <laughs> you know, talk about it as it was this, you know, this huge kind of unstoppable <laughs> force in the way that it kind of dominated things. And, well, and then did it had such a renaissance after a while too? It, came, it went away and then came back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I say, and I know, I mean, I, I'm a vi bitter old man, but it's the simplicity of it that that makes it uh, so viable for so p many people. They they can write without having to have a real technique. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to to write music. You really have to have a technique. You have to have studied an awful lot. And I mean, I I, I had a I have a friend was a painter and he <coughs> he was restoring paintings for s local museums and he said he could teach all the techniques of painting in less than two years and that, that, that the technical part of painting and you you and I and everyone that has ever gone into music knows that in two years you're scratching the surface of what yeah. you have to know to write music and uh, so you learn a 12-tone system and in six months you can write a, a symphony for me, that's not a technique. That's one aspect of a technique. I mean, I I just felt that it was uh, giving in to mm -hmm. to do to write twelve tone music. And that was your style. Yeah. Do you think that one of the reasons that um, twelve te tone technique was so common in um, in academia is because it was a way that it could be graded? You could say w um, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. and yet, I mean. God forbid, who, somebody's going to find a mistake in one of the Schoenberg pieces sometime. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I just, I feel that it's a very limiting way to write music. Not that it's, it doesn't have uh, viable uh, appurtenances, mm -hmm. like the, the business of the tropes and, <coughs> you know, it, uh, all of those things are... I mean, of course, it pales into insignificance of what I think of chance music. That that's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there any music? These narrow-minded old guys. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any music of Milton Babbitt that you that you that you like? Uh, I would have to say that Milton Babbitt music confuses me. Mm -hmm. I mean, ever since I met him. When we both got that uh, uh, award from the National Institute of Arts and Letters, right, and you both have pieces on that CRI, on that CRI, that I, 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 he's a charming man, and he's as intelligent and uh, is gifted uh, <laughs> in every way. But I don't understand his music at mm -hmm. all. What about Pierre Boulez? Well, I've gotten something out of, of Boulez. I've gotten some, some of the pieces. I. I won't pretend to know much about it, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. all, all of the, what I refer to as the iconoclastics, uh, I, I, I don't find myself that interested. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're working on your own stuff, it's I don't I don't feel it's beholden on me necessarily to know everything about all the pieces that come out. Yeah, well, it's it's really hard to kind of keep up on it. Otherwise, you, you won't, you won't up, write yeah. any music. If you I got to write yeah. my own stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, like that. I told my kids, you know, don't bother me with, don't bother bother me with facts. My mind is made up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this, um, 
the CRI um, recording, there's a piece called the Short Sonata for Violin and Harpsichord, yes. Opus 39. And the liner notes say that it uses a 12-tone melody in the opening section. Is that treated in any kind of serial fashion? Um, no, I just used the 12-tone the twelve tone row to make Danny happy. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that was Daniel Pinkham, right? Yeah, yeah. Who yeah, played harpsichord on that? Um, one of the interesting legacies of serialism, and I think you you mentioned this um, a little while ago, is that um, you know it brought some, it opened up new possibilities, of, you know, ways of making music, and there's certain kinds of musical gestures that come from that. That have are used by composers who are you know as far from from serialism as possible. Um, I think of George Rockberg, who was so public in his renunciation of that, but yet you can still find some serial-like yeah. gestures yeah. Um, in his music. Um, and I've found some of that in in your music as well. Sure. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. I, I mean, uh, well. You know, oh, I once had a teacher, uh, unnamed, who once asked me how I could have the patience to find all those notes, because I wrote a piece in which there was a running background, and you know, at the time, I, 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 uh, I almost said to him, well, I would have, you know, spent four, four, four or five times more if I needed to to find all those notes. And one of the things that a, the twelve tone has done for me is, for instance, when I do that cadence formula that I talked about, you can treat that. As uh, there's not a twelve tone row because it's no 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 attempt to avoid uh, any notes or anything like that. But when I need a whole series of running notes, let's say I want a sixteenth note figure that goes on for seven hundred thirty three notes, <laughs> well I can, I'll just run through the the goddamn chords up and down like this and then this this way, and I have all those notes, and it's still part of my uh, of my uh, harmonic. Uh, yeah cadence formula and it's a 12 tone technique which has stood me in good stead and uh, all it's done is to make certain one aspect of the of the uh, of the writing a little faster mm -hmm. and uh, I don't do it all the time but once in a while there it is right. I have all those notes I mean I have those chords and sometimes the chords are quite complex and uh, if, if, if I just run top I can I, I can play little games like this and like this and then like that <laughs> mm -hmm. if I need to right. to get notes and I remember an interesting thing John talking about this the piece you wrote uh, <coughs> for, for Phil Wilson the yes. uh, trombone and yeah. uh, orchestra uh, when you played it in, in uh, at the college uh, Don McDonald one yeah. of our colleagues uh, he said oh look at the opening uh, you've got uh, all all the 12 notes uh, being used in this in the opening yeah <laughs> and John said oh how cerebral cere cerebral yeah. cerebral <laughs> of me <laughs> and I remember Don was so surprised that that it wasn't some kind of plan you know uh -huh. that and John just this was the sound that, that he wanted yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> certainly wasn't writing 12 ton music yeah. right yeah. no I wasn't writing 12 ton <laughs> music no. but there it was yeah I've even found some places in your music where there's some pointillistic kinds of gestures, like the the opening of the trio for clarinet and piano, or clarinet, cello, and piano. Oh, that, yes. Um, with the with the, the eighth note figures going back and forth. Yeah. 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 Um, or some of these um, wide um, melodic skips, like there's some parts in the canto two for solo clarinet. Oh um, yes. Things yeah. like that, and those seem to come right out of twelve tone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's no uh, question. Yeah. Um, and um, s some places where you have uh, you're deliberately um, having an a, <coughs> a, an ambiguous rhythmic pulse um, by rhythmic change or, or meter changes and ties so you're you're yes. and that's <laughs> another legacy of, of that yes um, yeah superimposing seven eight over a four four texture for instance yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i do that all the time yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that's that's obviously you i mean the 12 tone used it i mean the serial composers used it but of course it, it didn't originate with them right and hemiola i think even mozart used it <laughs> Um, this um, 
relating to stuff we were talking earlier, um, um, you talk about your music as having, um, you know, some 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 tonal centers. It's not obvious to um, somebody initially hearing your music or say, uh, um, you know, the, the concert going public, um, and they're going to hear the, the dissonant harmonic language. And um, there are some critics and theorists who, who claim that music like that is, is not, um, as they say, natural or it's, it's not human. Um, um, you know, particularly, you know, a, a, a dissonant harmonic language. Um, I'm sure people have have asked you about that or accused oh, sure. you of that. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Is that well? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, the thing is that dissonance uh, it depends on who's listening. Right. Um, I remember I had a I wrote a brass quartet one time for Roger Vosan, and when it was performed. Uh, Harold Rogers, who was the critic at this Christian Science Monitor at the time, said that uh, you know the the piece was technically adept and uh, uh, rhythmically exciting, but it was so dissonant, you know, that he hoped next time Mr. Bavicki wrote a piece that it would use dissonance for musical reasons, so <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and I said to myself, well, there's a guy who really understands my music. <laughs> <laughs> but the opening of the Bar Talk Fourth Quartet. Yeah, I mean, is that doesn't it? Well, I I don't, right? I don't find that particularly right. dissonant, right. and yet I know people who would absolutely cringe if they if they listen to that piece. Mm. Yeah, dissonance depends on who's listening to it, and I don't think it's whether it's dissonant or not that matters. It's what happens with with the dissonance. Mm -hmm. I mean, dissonance in, in music is forward motion, and. Right. If it goes somewhere, then dissonance serves its purpose. I mean, right. that's the only way I can feel about it. Now, some of these critics, they talk about the, the harmonic series and that music must, in some ways, um, be fundamentally rooted in a harmonic series and that dissonant harmony is a rejection of that. And they're saying that the harmonic series is mm -hmm. embedded in our DNA and, to, and to, yeah. to not do that. That's antediluvian. Yeah. It really is. I yeah. mean, it, and that's gaining um, some some real traction with some some theorists these days. Is it really? really? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. frightening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. Wow. Um, <laughs> Perish the thought. <laughs> I wonder if you have some some thoughts on this, since you also teach um, some music theory classes, um, and I found this in, in school um, um, puzzling and um, per perplexing. Um, there's this 20th century fixation on pitch as a primary, as the primary music parameter from which to analyze um, a piece of music. Um, pitch. Pitch, um, and there's this almost kind of obsession with that, almost to the point that you forget that it's actually music. Um, do you have any kind of, do you have any comments about that? Um, well, you know I. Uh, some of the music criticisms of, of the past have been running about, well, they, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the fellow who wrote those horrible books on Beethoven quartets, Malyov, I don't know. It, it refers to the, the purple Neapolitan, you know, and, uh, and the, the, the bright, key of E major and all of these things and yet what he's talking about at the time Beethoven's pitch was considerably lower than ours right so Be 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 Beethoven said well you you don't know what you're talking about my good friend because <laughs> <laughs> what Beethoven thought of as as a, a, a Neapolitan in in a flat in, in a minor for instance certainly wouldn't be the same sound today right nowhere yeah. near it right and so, therefore, mm. all of that kind of descriptive baloney is worthless, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I really don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it. Again, I'm proving my antediluvianism. Can't help it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you notice, with um, a lot of kind of analysis courses, they're strictly talking about um, pitch and harmony. Um, 
but almost to the exclusion of the rest of what actually makes the the, the music um, you know what it what it really is yeah um, and I've just been really um, um, at times baffled by that well um, I, I would be too <laughs> I mean for me the the form and the and the use of the harmony is much more <laughs> more pertinent. And and, and they almost ig a lot of times they ignore rhythm and <coughs> um, and mm. you know those other things that, that really make the the um, the piece. It seems as though they have this kind of quasi scientific way that they're trying to justify it and pitch because it, it's you can quantify it in a certain way. Mm. They're kind of obsessed with that, but. Um, and what really makes a piece what it is is, is kind of hard to quantify. Yeah, that whole concept is an amusical concept anyway. Mm -hmm. right? It has nothing to do with the music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you? Um, one of the interesting things with um, with in the twentieth century and now the twenty first century is how, with some composers, rhythm has um, been kind of liberated from pitch, so you can have. Um, you know, percussion ensemble pieces where there's no pitched um, instruments and stuff like that. Um, how has that concept of, of um, rhythm um, figured in, in your music? Oh, very strongly. I mean, I think uh, anyone who's heard my pieces, uh, the rhythm is uh, <laughs> more important perhaps than uh, almost anything else sometimes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And there are many times uh, I mean, you have a texture going, you know, and something going, and then, then splat, you know, and then, then splat. And I told somebody one time that it didn't matter what the notes were, I could play anything because it came rhythmically at that time. And they, they thought that was being very cavalier. <laughs> but that's how I feel. That rhythmically, is, that's what drives music is the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, even the cursory listening to any, any piece I've written. People would understand yeah. that. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another um, prominent aspect of some 20th century and uh, music or contemporary music is how timbre has become much more a, a primary um, focus with with some composers, um, even with um, Edgar Varese and Penderecki and Ligeti and and currently um, Sofia Gobaidelina and this um, Finnish composer, sorry, ha -ho. Sorry, sorry, yeah. 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 Um, How How do you think of, of, um, of Tambor? Well, I mean, ever since, you know, ever since Berlioz, what's the succession? First he has a, a, a viola, I mean, in, in, in the fantastic symphony, some of the orchestration, the timbres which which he uses are so unusual for the time, and it's it's, it's uh, twas ever thus. I mean, I, th I think that's part of composing, isn't it? I mean, even um, uh, even the Bach and the uh, snake-like music when there's this reference to a snake in the text and things yeah. like that. I mean, uh, mm. it's always. I don't think it's anything new. I think it's just right. yeah. But it, the, sometimes the way it's new is where it, it becomes almost, if for some composers, it, it, um, it's more important sometimes than the melody. So you're oh, really yeah. focusing on that. And that that's kind of where it's, it's yeah. new. Well, I, I mean, after the Schoenberg five pieces for orchestra, I don't know that anyone should ever worry about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, that's the tour de force of that particular right. idea. I mean, and, I mean, for instance, that trio of mine that you spoke about, I remember a couple of places where I trade off between the cello and the clarinet, one takes over. It's a very nice um, aspect of the timbre because you know, on the same pitch, you know, you can hardly tell where one begins and the other ends. And it's, it's, it's interesting, but I think it's part of composing, but of course, like anything else, if you take one thing and make it everything, then it's not, <laughs> mm -hmm. not viable. Mm -hmm. Have you had any um, experience or interest in um, so-called electronic music? Zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any of that that repertoire that you like? You know, Vlad Usachevsky or Otto Luning, Mario Davidovsky or Edgar Varese? No, I, I just I just uh, tell people I'm an old guy and that's it. 
I don't even think about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have find I find nothing uh, of interest to me there, and I, I realize that the world is passing me by. But so be it. <laughs> I uh, ever since the beginning of that, uh, I mean, th is it music? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's music. Mm -hmm. It's something. I mean, it's an organization of sound. Yeah, that's what John Cage and I agreed on one day. An organization of sound. Uh huh. Mm. So you've had some conversations with, with John Cage. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. I, that's that's yeah. that's that's fascinating. I um, I've been oh, very well, interested really in his work for for a long time. Well, he's yeah. a very interesting man. He. Had, I mean, once I found out he was a president of the American Mushroom Association, <laughs> I said, oh, he's a guy, so, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> I remember a, a project he proposed to his pupils one time to write a one-minute piece with three notes. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. No. Yeah. And uh, he explained to me, uh, that he told the kids to write a piece one minute long with three notes, and he gave them ten minutes to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "I'll write one too." And then uh, he he wrote one in about forty-five seconds, <laughs> and they're sweating away. And uh, the solution was, I, I attended this lecture with uh, Steve Addis, who was I went to Harvard with, and uh, <laughs> his solution was, you drew a circle as perfect as possible. And uh, he had dots with the pencil either inside the circle, on the circle, or outside the circle. The inside the circle was F sharp, the circle was G, and outside was A flat. And you went like this, and then you went. And you wrote a piece. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he said you would have to develop a new style of conducting, where the, the composer, the conductor, would go like this for 30 seconds, and then. He said you'd have to learn how to make the switch and go around here for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so with that's how you could write a piece for one minute long using three notes. <laughs> <laughs> he had a very, very inventive mind. I just, I'm yeah. still amazed. One aspect, well, there's, it's hard for me to, to stop talking about Cage because there's so much that I'm interested. There's a lot of his, um, his music that he wrote before he got into, to, to chance music, I think is some really extraordinary music that is um, being ignored because it has his name on it. Do you know that that ballet score, The Seasons? It's an orchestra. No, piece. I don't. No. Um, Love to hear. The um, the Boston Symphony did it a few years ago. They played it very badly, but the reviewers couldn't get over the fact that John Cage had written a piece that had as they called, as they said, beautiful harmonies. And so <laughs> the, the reviewer couldn't actually listen to the piece and judge it on its own merits. Uh -huh. um, but there's a whole body of his work yeah. that traditionally trained musicians could play, and if it had some other composer's name on it, this music would be in the repertoire. Hmm. Um, um, yeah. You must give us some recording to that. Yeah. yeah I have no, no idea. There's some extraordinary stuff, and I I have played some of the music for, for people, did, but I didn't tell them who it was. And then you tell him it was Cage. This one guy got angry at me. He said, "You caught me with my pants down." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> you can do that with a Beethoven choral fantasy anytime you want to yeah. confuse people. <laughs> so, um, moving on here, um, I want to ask you about some of the people you consider your composer colleagues. There's obviously Tom here, um, but who are um, some of the? Are there any composers that you've um, kind of felt? You know, close to it in, in a collegial way over the years. In a what way? In a, in a collegial way. Oh, um, you mean wh whose music I, 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 I yeah, like? And, and oh, yeah, pe and people that you've that besides you've known. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerry. Yeah, I, I, I was, you know, Nick Van Slyke wrote some very interesting things. I mean, I always, you know, I've respected what he did and. Right. Kaczynskis, of course, was one of my best friends, and uh, you know Dave Callahan wrote a piece that's not bad. Yes, I yeah. heard that piece. Yes, yeah. Uh, most of the people that I've been colleagues with, I uh, Bill, I get something. Bill Maloof, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, 
Dennis, you know. Uh, Dennis LeClaire? Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, all the people that I've worked with uh, who write music, I've certainly. Mm -hmm. And with my course, I did uh, every colleague that I ever had, I have, I've done the music of. I mean, and with the, or with the orchestra, too. I did Maloof and uh, Naga and Kachiskas and LeClaire and. And very generous with you. Yeah, when and, and everybody else too. I mean, on the staff, the yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, Steve Prosser and uh, the guy from Connecticut, uh, Birdwood. <laughs> Wellwood. Wellwood, yeah. Arthur Wellwood. Yeah. He wrote a piece for the chorus, and one of the guys didn't like us. He kept calling him Birdwood. <laughs> oh, <gee>. oh God! <laughs> <laughs> I never told Arthur. <laughs> but uh, everybody that I've ever. You know, I've had uh, colleagues. I've done their music, mm -hmm. and in including my best pupils, I've always, th if they were good enough, mm -hmm. I had them write a piece for my chorus, chamber, uh, cho chamber chorus. Yeah, you've been um, a, a, just a wonderful advocate for yes. for contemporary music in the area and yeah. getting um, composers' music um, performed. Well, you know, I tell you how I felt about that. But when I when I took the when I got the f chamber chorus formed from the two choruses. I mean, you know that what they pay you that they pay what they can, but it's not. It's it's at least you, the most musical job you have is the least paid you get. Right. It's always that way, and uh, so I, I mean, I mean, it was p perfectly clear to them that the the reason I stayed was that I, I I could do these pieces, and every year I did either a colleague or a student. Right, and this and is the Arlington Belmont Chamber Chorus, right? Belmont Chamber Chorus, the yeah. Belmont, the Arlington Belmont uh, yeah, Chorus, yeah. the uh, the uh, Berkeley Concert Band, uh, mm -hmm. everything that I had anything to do with. I right. always did contemporary pieces. Right. And, uh, you know, some, some very wonderful pieces. And you made uh, wonderful uh, Opportunity uh, presented wonderful opportunities uh, through your connection with John Corley for yes, yeah. colleagues and and yes and, and I would always say yeah, John would I always you know I would always tell John mm -hmm. this guy could write a piece it would be worth it and so John did a whole bunch of Berkeley people uh, right and, and I, I would tell my pupil that they were going to write a piece for the MIT concert band and would help them with it and uh, Dave Mott was one of the first ones and mm -hmm. uh, and of course uh, we got uh, Tom and. Dennis never could do it. He never wanted to write one. Mm, that's right. But Bill did, certainly. Yeah. And uh, I, Sylvia, Alain, yeah. and... Uh, oh, Christoph. Christoph. Yeah. Whole Gosh, bunch a lot of them. Yeah. Christos. I mean, a whole yeah. bunch of uh, my pupils yeah. and all of my colleagues that, that yeah. I would... Uh, that John did and because I... Well, he and I would talk about it and, he, and uh, I would pick the person for the next year. Right. And John Corley was good about getting some commission money for for some of these. Oh, that's right. And he was. That was when the, when he was able to, he got yeah, some commission yeah. money for them. Yeah. And he was a real national leader among um, concert band conductors um, in g having getting new music written for for the yeah. that ensemble yeah. as opposed to doing orchestral transcriptions. Yeah. Well, that that was his credo, and that's why he and I were such good friends. Yeah. He wouldn't do anything that was a transcription. Right. And. Uh, right. That's the way it should be. Right. <laughs> and what was interesting talking with him, it was not ideologically written or um, driven, that, that idea. It was just for him, he, his idea was that we have so many orchestras in the area, why should we do orchestral music? Why don't we do music? Um, that's for a band, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, I was just really struck how unideological mm -hmm. that idea was for him. Because yeah. you could see with some people it might be this ideological thing ideological thing we don't do transcriptions yes, that's right because yes. he also did had done his own transcriptions for of orchestral stuff for concert band you know throughout his career yeah, yeah, yeah. but his idea was in metropolitan boston why should um, they not necessary this? yeah mm -hmm. and I, I was really struck by that mm -hmm. yeah. in the previous interview we really didn't touch on your work um, as a as a choral conductor you were a conductor of the Arlington Belmont Chorale for 44 years and the Arlington Belmont Chamber Chorus for 29 years. At least that's what I've been able to dig up. Maybe those those number of years aren't uh, completely correct. But Pretty close. <laughs> um, um, how did your interest in choral conducting come about? 
Well, um, <coughs> it came about because the one thing I was lacking when I was writing music was the feeling for time scale. I mean, it was very deliberate on my part to try and find a job because I felt I wasn't a good enough performer. Uh, I mean, as a pianist, I was, you know, bumbling idiot. <laughs> as a trombonist, I was good, but what can you do with a solo trombone? And I felt that the most important thing about music, one of the most important things, was the time scale of how long something went on. And at the time, you know, when I was much younger, I didn't realize that it was the form that I was thinking about. But I went after trying to get a conducting job uh, to, to be able to f perform music, to see how that affected, uh, you know, the writing. And my, my, my good friend at the time, John Moriarty, uh, found a uh, job, heard about a job, because the, a friend of his had been accompanying a chorus and then got a new accompanist and the conductor had left the Canton Community Chorus. Mm -hmm. And I conducted that for a few years. And, uh, and that was in Canton, Massachusetts, Yes, right? yeah. yeah. And then uh, I did the Canton, I did, uh, I had the Dedham Chorus, I had the Belmont Chorus, and the Arlington Chorus, and since Belmont and Arlington were so close to together, I came up with the idea of combining them. And after a while, I convinced some people to, to do that. And then by combining them, there were enough people to, by audition, have a chamber chorus. And so we ended up, uh, I conducted the orchestra, the chamber chorus, and, the, and the, com the big chorus. And it gave me all kinds of opportunity to do contemporary music. And it's for me to learn the literature and to, to my bet noir, the, the time scale about how things should relate to each other in a, in a composition. Because mm -hmm. when you're composing, you, you, you're not experiencing things necessarily in real time. But as a performer, you have to. That's right. Um, yeah, that's and right. I think some composers who aren't, don't do any performing, they kind of lose that. Well, in, it's obviously, it's obvious when you see comp student works, the slow movements are always much too long because they, they use up too much paper. <laughs> 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 and the fast movements are much too short because they've used so much paper they figure they've written a piece. Yeah. I mean, it, it, those are little nasty little things that you have to learn. And uh, that was my method to, f to try and learn it because uh, I knew that what Beethoven did was right. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out why. But uh, it was it was on purpose. I, I mean, I'd been th through the war so I knew uh, a little bit about life. So. <laughs> you know, one thing wa wasn't mentioned there, uh, Forrest, is uh, the number of years you conducted the Arlington Philharmonic. Yeah. At the same time. Oh as yes. As well as the choral groups, yeah. you know. Oh, I did so the orchestra. Pretty busy. Over twenty. Kind of a busy week, wouldn't you? How many oh, yeah. rehearsals uh, sometimes? One, Three a week. One year I had seven rehearsals a week. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. And I always said, for many years, I had three rehearsals a week with the orchestra, the chorus, and the chamber chorus. And uh, that's why I never figured on writing much during the winter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's why I wouldn't teach in the summer. Mm -hmm. So the summers were your yeah. time to really compose, yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk about, um, I guess, both with the um, choruses, um, I, 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 that was the reason behind this question, but maybe also with um, your work with the orchestras, Working with amateur musicians, but doing challenging contemporary works, um, and you seem to be particularly successful in um, motivating people to to to, to do that. Can, right. you, can you talk about um, <coughs> that experience? Well, yes. I, I mean, the thing, the important thing is that you have to have people's confidence, and working with amateurs is a very different thing than some people try to make it. I mean, you can't do something that. That with them that they can't do, and uh, I, if I could just tell some of the younger people that are working with amateurs, that, that it's stupid to spend twenty minutes on five measures and get it perfect, and then the next time they won't remember, and you have wasted all that rehearsal time in getting a continuous performance. I mean, it's so important with amateurs the continuity and w spending time. And in, in effect, you have to close your ears temporarily 
to things that need to be corrected. And of course, you pay the price with somebody saying, well, you, you didn't hear that. <laughs> you want to kick them or something. <laughs> but OK, you have to put up with some people not understanding. But you've got to be consecutive with amateurs. Once they learn that, they're able to tackle things. And with the chamber course, I was able to tackle contemporary pieces that were way beyond them because they all were in the in the habit of being able to go through a piece no matter what. And I did some of the great pieces that I had no right to do, the Bruckner E minor mass, E major mass. I had no right to do that. But and the Bruckner Te Deum. I was able to do those because I had trained them to be consecutive. And I did orchestral pieces I had no right to do whatsoever. I had to close my ears to certain imperfections. But with amateurs, in the first place, they don't even realize the imperfections half the time. In the second place, they're enjoying it, and it's fun. And and conductors who try to take amateurs as, a, as if they were professionals are making a sad mistake, that's all. Mm -hmm. And I, I was able to convince and it wasn't a hard job, just, I mean, the chamber course knew that they were going to do a contemporary piece every year. And they did it. And some of them they liked, and some of them they universally, one guy universally hated everything. But he did it because the process was enjoyable. And some of the pieces they had wonderful time with, they, you know. They, they did a piece of Jeffrey Bishop's, the good fellow at Oxford Press that I was so friendly with. And they couldn't stand it at first, but then they saw how clever it was, and they, they had a lot of fun with it, most of them. And so I was able to do, every year, a contemporary piece with the chamber chorus. And then when I got somebody like Tom, I could do it, you know, who knew what the hell he was doing. <laughs> I could do a piece with the, the big ch chorus and with the, with the, with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for instance, Bill Maloof and Tom have written for the big chorus, the orchestra, and the chamber chorus. And... Uh, you know, with somebody who knows what they're doing, I could I could do that, and they were ready to to accept it. The orchestra maybe less than the others, but mm -hmm. yeah. their egos are a little more fragile. <laughs> what I find interesting with um, the scores of the choral pieces I've seen that you loan me, um, you're not afraid to use dissonant harmony. There, some composer, contemporary composers, when they're writing for chorus, they ch they decide that they have to use a constant. Um, harmonic language because they're afraid that they're either the course won't like it or they won't be able to sing it in tune. But you... No, well, that's uh, that's just experience uh, conducting a uh, course because, I mean, uh, to sing a minor second, you say, well, that's impossible. But it isn't. I mean, if, if, if let's say that the altos and the and the tenors are on, 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 on C and the tenors go down to B, then we've got a minor second. And nobody's in any question about what the pitch is, yeah, because right. they just want to mind a second down. If you approach it that way, you can use some distances. You you can't use you can't you can't land on a chord that's built in seconds, because they haven't got a ghost of a chance to hit in a, in a hundred years. Right. But you could you could go from unisons to to a second, in both voices, and you could end up with, I mean, for instance, if you had the 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 women and and the men a fifth apart and had them both go a, a major second on either side, yeah. you'd have a chord in seconds and they wouldn't have had any problem, but they have to have the unison first. Right. If you try to land on that chord, forget yeah. it, yeah. you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just certain intervals, I mean, and my, um, it's easy for them to sing a major seventh up because they can think of the octave. Mm. But to sing a major seventh down, my God, yeah. <laughs> you'd think it was a different world. They can, you know, yeah. <laughs> little things like that. Yeah. But that's just experience, that's all. Yeah. And a tritone. If it's part of a dominant seventh chord, it's a snap. Yeah. But out of the blue? Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I've been curious about that too. <laughs> <laughs> the um, choice of texts for your um, music. Um, the what? The, the choice of texts. Oh, texts. Yeah. Do you often have ch choice, or does that come f from the, the the person who commissioned it? Um, normally, it comes from the person who commissioned it. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, when uh, 
when I wrote, wrote that piece to call the Linson Fragments, yeah, it's because one of my pupils has presented me with four volumes of poetry that he'd written, and he was one of my most intelligent. Uh, I mean, he's a tr tremendous pupil. And so what I did was to extract some things from there that I could set. Mm -hmm. And he said now that when he hears that piece, when he sees that text of his, all I can think of is my, my treatment of it in music. <laughs> I've remained good friends with him because he's going to Harvard now and getting his doctorate in uh, education. So um, how do you judge a text as suitable for a musical setting? Well, I remember reading that Schubert could have set a menu, and <laughs> that set me to thinking that uh, <laughs> maybe I could set a menu too, but it isn't that. I, I find, for instance, Tennyson. If, if it's, it's so musical by itself that I, I've used a lot of Tennyson. Mm -hmm. When I was commissioned to do a, a, a piece for soprano and, and symphony orchestra, there was sweet music here. I, I went, you know, it's it's easy because you could find uh, music in 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 the words and uh, I set I mean for instance I set uh, what was it called talk to me because the f the poet was uh, teaching English at Berkeley and I got very friendly with him Steve and uh, for my memory. What was his name? I yeah, I, I, anyway, felt, I wrote yeah, that <laughs> because I liked him. He and I were f friends, and so he, I, I said, "Give me a poem, and I'll set it." And I did. Mm -hmm. And in, in a way, you can set anything you want to. You just have to be able to take it seriously. That's all. Sometimes I've there's vocal music that I, that the, the the musical writing is fine, but the the text just seems to be a vehicle for the notes. And it could be any words. Um, how do you see the relationship between the text and well, the music? I I think that the music is it depends on what the words Im imply. I mean, I think you know in in the Capriccio, the, you know, first the words or first the music. You know, the argument. Well, it's first the words because even the, even if I am the composer, <laughs> because the words dictate what kind of music you have. Right. And then all the leader that, that, that all the great songs that Schubert and Schumann and Brahms and, right. and, and Wolf uh, did, uh, the text di dictates what happens in the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean I don't think there's any question about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, a couple more c c concluding things. What kinds of uh, hobbies or interests do you have outside of music? What What are some things that you like to do with it? Too have many. <laughs> I waste so much time. <laughs> I, I, the 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 biggest thing probably was uh, I did an awful lot of uh, building things when I was younger. I was able to move around. You know, I built the shelves and I built myself a bar and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, the the most the biggest thing uh, outside of music would, would be the stamps. I mean, I've I've collected and sold stamps all my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I have uh, very extensive German and uh, uh, American collections still. I've gotten rid of the rest of them, but my German collection is about six volumes. Wow. <laughs> some very interesting stuff. Wow. So, how far back do some of these stamps oh, go? Oh. 1845. <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, so your uh, your engineering background has helped you with them, your 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 building interests and stuff. Oh like yes, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, what, once an Italian, always a carpenter. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got some other hobbies too. Yeah, yeah. People accuse me of being of being uh, uh, drinking too much, but I don't drink too much. Just enough. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, things like everything else if you enjoy it it's fine yeah <laughs> I understand you like rum particularly yeah. I'm very fond of rum uh -huh. and bourbon and scotch and uh -huh. gin and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. 
You know, I, I found recently from a, a new friend of mine, <coughs> you know what a doctor's definition of an alcoholic is? What's that? A patient that drinks more than he does. <laughs> 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 and it's of course it, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to find that uh, uh, up to three ounces of alcohol a day is beneficial to the human male, and I uh, certainly never exceed that. So, <laughs> well, except on occasional weekends. <laughs> <laughs> so to um, to conclude here, are there any? Final comments, or that you want to make about anything, or is there a topic that I haven't touched on that um, you want to want to talk about? All I could say is that without music, life would be very different. <laughs> That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and without my music, I wouldn't be me. That's a is there any? What music are you working on now? Is there a particular piece you're working on? I just finished a big piece for clarinet and mezzo soprano solos. With uh, I was c commissioned by Gary Dranch, who did my clarinet concerto in Brazil a couple of years ago, and he's a wonderful player. To write this piece for him and his mezzo soprano, um, and I was given the tr to to write for her as if she were uh, Octavio in the <laughs> in the oh. <laughs> in the Rosen Cavalier, so I had pretty good pretty good range, wow. and. Uh, and uh, he wanted a piece was kaleidoscopic in the in the sense that Piero in there was uh, with the instrumentation and everything. So what I did was, I have a string quartet, a brass quintet, piano, percussion, and a chamber chorus, and the two soloists. And I have a arch form piece, and I use the total ensemble only on the outside movements in the middle one. And there's about uh, seventeen or eighteen uh, songs on. Hi he wanted me to use haiku. I use haiku and tanka and shoka, the uh, three uh, main Japanese poet poetic forms. Wow! And uh, I have three, uh, three, uh, six haiku altogether, and six tanka and the one shoka, which is uh, much longer, as the middle one. And I just finished it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Wow. I'm putting it. I'm putting it into Music Printer Plus now <laughs> on the computer. So, is there a, a performance coming up? Well, would like to have a performance, and uh, there's a possibility maybe a year from th from uh, October, and uh, I don't know what he's got if he has any ideas or not. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, it will be done sometime. I mean, the fact that it was commissioned, you would hope that he would then. Yeah, well, he's uh, he's a wonderful uh, influence for contemporary, as many clarinetists seem to be. I mean, they they're interested in getting people to write. For their instrument, mm -hmm. and he's an incredible artist. I mean. <laughs> wow! So how do you how did you meet him? Well, I, I met him because he he wrote to me and said <coughs> he was uh, going to do my concerto in Brazil. Fantastic! And could I do something about maybe you know uh, calming down the rights that Oxford Press had, and so that he could be recorded and all that. And so we got to be very friendly. And since then, he's done my my unaccompanied clarinet sonatas and uh, my quintet for clarinet and strings, and uh, I'm writing this piece for him. Fantastic! I've written this piece for him. It's Fantastic. done now. Wow. So, Tom, did you have any uh, um, questions? Oh, there's one other topic, and I I guess we skipped over it. back to your 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 vocal music. Um, do you see any um, distinct stylistic differences between the, the, your vocal and instrumental music? Well, I think that the, the, the voice parts have to be simpler, or they can't sing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I said, I, that's a stylistic difference, I would guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, the distance has, as, as we were talking about before, if, if you don't handle the distance correctly, they can't sing it. Right. And so. Uh, I mean, you you tell a clarinet to play a C sharp when somebody else is playing a C natural, so he, he plays it. You know, mm -hmm. you tell a tenor to sing a C sharp when all he can hear is a C. <laughs> right. I was talking with with Tom about your music, and Tom hears a real 
difference he describes your vocal music as kind of romantic and your instrument is instrumental music is, is more if you will modernist yeah I don't hear the difference so much that way but again that might that's just my ears but um, have other people kind of described it that way and um, I, I don't no, I don't think yeah. so. I mean, I, I I don't know. I mean, I'd say your your solo songs, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about the choral music. Yeah, but, yeah. but the solo songs. Yeah, I've always, yeah, I, I've yeah. always startles me. That yeah. I say this. The romantic, lush romantic you know, quality. I, I don't mean romantic sounding like you wrote it in 1850 no, no, or something. No, no, I understand. Yeah. But, but you know, Tom, I, I I think everything I write is romantic. I mean, that's the way I feel. Well, I feel yeah. that I'm a romantic composer. That's all. Displaced mm -hmm. by a few, few <laughs> centuries, <laughs> uh -huh. I, I I approach it as I, I think mm. as romantic music, even though the sounds are not. But yeah. I mean, but, the but Bartok is a romantic composer. Yeah, as far as your, your gestures are very much rooted in, in that tradition. I and think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. the the rhythms and, and all that. And yeah, no, what mm. the, the, you know, the songs, yeah. Uh, mm. Probably it's I remember the, the, the bare bones show a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember the songs that Sharon, uh, uh, Sherry, uh, um, Sharon Baker, Baker, yeah, <laughs> uh, sang uh, at the Harvard Musical Association. Oh yes, uh, yeah. I think it was maybe your seventieth. My seventieth birthday, yeah. yeah. And uh, I had just written them for so, her, yeah. So yeah. beautiful, so yeah. lyrical. So, so what's what what pieces did she do? She did the uh, uh, there were six songs for. Uh, uh, piano, uh, soprano, and violin. The po poetry of William Blake. Cool. Yeah. I'd love and to see uh, the score for that. She, she, they did a good mm -hmm. job. The violinist was not quite up, to, but it, that's the only performance they've ever had. <laughs> yeah. You know, th that may be because it, it, I used to all, all modes for those. I used all the seven modes, mm. and for those songs, I did uh, nothing but modal. Yeah. Counterpoint, uh, everything, uh, yeah. Probably contributed to that, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I would love to hear those. That's too bad. Uh, that's That was yeah. 14 years ago now. Yeah. So yeah. That's too bad, yeah. They were beautiful. Yeah. Or they still are. <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, been trying to get the, uh, Robin to do something, but so far, no, no bites. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we can talk more after um, we um, c conclude the, the interview. And I want to thank you so much for um, for sharing your, your thoughts today. This is this is really, really good. Um, oh, thank you. Um, this has been just a, an honor and privilege to, to do this with you. Yeah. So thank you again.